And I think we are live. Welcome back to The Horse Race, your weekly look at politics, policy, and elections here in Massachusetts. I'm Stephanie Murray, here with my excellent co-hosts, Jennifer Smith and Steve Cazella, president of the Massing Polling Group. So welcome to everyone to our happy hour live stream. We're now in June. You know, I think we're finally getting used to this, uh, you know, sipping beers and wine at 4.30 on camera uh, in the afternoon. So what is everybody drinking? Jen, let's start with you. All right, so I am drinking something very interesting, which is a gin and tonic, but half of the gin has been replaced with Pims. So it's like a weird fancy and probably offensive to the British cocktail. <laughs> interesting. I wish that I had something good to report. I am drinking water out of a gi gigantic ball mason jar, which I suppose is different than usual, but just water for me today. I think hydration is key. I went with uh, with a mango flavored beer because it is finally summer. But I think we all agreed that beer is like the lowest, <laughs> the lowbrow. Uh, I don't like judge. We don't judge. Whatever makes you happy these days. I'm just aspiring to continue to be the person really killing the cocktail game. And then the rest of you can represent whatever local beers you want. But like, look, folks, we're drinking here in the safety of our homes. But you know where you can drink now? I hear you can drink outside at restaurants. Right, we're in a new phase. We're now in phase two, uh, phase two of reopening. There's a whole bunch of new rules that are out there and it's kind of changing day-to-day -day life, I think. I mean, a bunch of new stuff is permitted. Everything sort of has a different rule that you have to follow at a set of rules in order to do it. But um, I, for me, it's actually changing day-to-day -day life already. How about for you? Is it Are things different? I mean, are you doing different things than you've been doing so far in lockdown or is life pretty much the same? I was just getting used to following the one-way arrows at the grocery store. So all of this is a very big change <laughs> for me. You know, I was kind of like used to being a hermit in my house. Uh, so I've been, I went out to eat one time um, and I got a lobster roll and it was very exciting. Um, so have you guys like emerged at all and, and done stuff? No, that's a hard no from me. I, yeah. uh, what, part of it, obviously, is that every time I leave my house, I'm reminded of uh, why trying to go anywhere with people around during the coronavirus is, is going to freak me out. For instance, grocery stores. Stephanie, you brought up arrows. Some people still haven't learned how to follow arrows. It seems like the kind of thing which you would just like give give people really dirty looks for if you were like walking down the right way and someone was walking towards you. Oh, I do. But over a mask, it doesn't have quite the same effect. I've got no. to like really furrow my brow. Yeah. What's that like the smizing thing that Tyra <laughs> used to talk about on Top Model? You have to like really be expressive. With yeah, your exactly. Uh, but but the you know, opposite. All of these new rules. And so we're in phase two, but we're not in step two of phase two. It's kind of like all of these extra abridged and kind of confusing things. Um, so, you know, I think we're all just kind of waiting to see what the next step is going to be. And of course, whether we'll be able to move into phase three and then phase four and other states where they've reopened more quickly, it seems like they're pausing or even taking a step back if they see cases going up. So this is one of those things that's still super fluid um, since there's no playbook, you know, none of us have lived through uh, a world changing pandemic before. Yeah, and I mean, one of the things that uh, Governor Baker said on Monday when he was talking about this and reiterated again today during his coronavirus press conference is that we haven't reached the point right now where we want to, for instance, pull the ripcord and backtrack, which if you recall on sort of the very first chart that they rolled out with the phased reopening plan, um, they had talked about the possibility that if reopening had caused a spike in new cases, then they might be backtracking. But what he did say is that the four key coronavirus metrics that they're monitoring continue to show downward trends. So we're not at the um, backtrack stage right now. Um, so what's going on with testing? Yeah, there's uh, the the four key things that they're they're looking at are uh, the weighted average of positive the positive molecular test rate. In other words, of all the tests that they're doing, how many are coming back positive? Um, that's that particular metric is down 91 percent according to the uh, data that they have been that that uh, the mass that's posted there on mass.gov. 91 percent from when when they started tracking it on May 17 May 17th. Um, the other thing that they oh. It looks like I'm actually I'm going to be able to share share the data here. Um, another thing that they so that one we were just talking about is now showing at the top of the screen for those of you watching on the video. Um, for those of you watching on live stream later, I'll just or listening listening later. The other things that it shows is the three day average of people hospitalized. 
Um, and then the numbers of hospitals using surge capacity and the three-day average of COVID-19 deaths. So all of these things have gone down somewhere between 70 and 90 and 91 percent, which is really, really good news, I think, for all of us here in Massachusetts. And also good news because this is not uniformly the case across the country. In some places, we're seeing the highest cases ever, the highest new cases ever. Um, so the, this is especially good news also because of all the protests that have happened, which now began more than two weeks ago. So the fact that we're still, we're not seeing any sort of resurgence is great news for the state of Massachusetts. And the state's made it pretty easy to get tested for coronavirus if you've been to a protest in the last couple of weeks. I think today we're we're Wednesday. So today and tomorrow, there are some pretty, I think, 50 different testing sites you can go to to get tested for free. The city of Boston did something similar last weekend. Um, so, so many people getting tested, not so many people testing positive. It seems like we're moving in the right direction. Yeah. And one of the other things that came up, of course, all of these uh, Baker press conferences tend to be focused around coronavirus and the response. But of course, as we know, there have been now pushing weeks of protest following the death of George Floyd at the hands of a police officer. And uh, Governor Baker announced a new policing bill that we're going to be talking about a little bit later in more depth with, uh, with Rep Liz Miranda. So we'll talk about that. But that also was something that he announced today during the press conference. That's right. Um, I'm looking, definitely looking forward to that, that conversation. We're also making a real effort to go beyond just the coronavirus here, news here on the horse race. Um, and there's a ton going on in Massachusetts and also across the country that has an impact here in Massachusetts. So let's start off with legal news. Stephanie, what do we have on legal news? Yes, there is some other news going on uh, that you might have heard about, and that's the multiple landmark decisions that are coming out of the highest court in the land this week and joining us as always but in a new context is our very own horse race in-house legal analyst and let me see what the script says i'm supposed to call you countess of court case conclusions jennifer smith so yes. again, thank you for being here you were here anyways but it's good to see you in this capacity so tell us what's happening with the supreme court this week well, first, I'd expect the Supreme Court is going to rule against that being an appropriate legal title. But aside from that, aside Countess, from- I think Countess is good. I don't know, man. This is bringing back monarchy, duchies. I think we we as Americans are kind of against those. Um, right, fair enough. <laughs> But so what did actually happen today is the LGBTQ workers were granted a historic victory when the Supreme Court ruled Monday that the federal law that bans sex discrimination in employment does apply to LGBTQ employees. Now, part of the 1964 Civil Rights Act bans workplace discrimination on the basis of sex, among other classifications like race, religion, and national origin. But there's been a pretty fraught fight about whether that protected LGBTQ individuals. And six to three, the Supreme Court ruled this week that it absolutely does. So two questions. First of all, I think a lot of people wrongly apparently assume that this was already illegal, that you already couldn't discriminate in, in employment based on LGBTQ um, status. Uh, so I guess that's not a question so much as just an expression of astonishment on behalf of the public. But what was the logic? How do they apply? Um, how do they apply the this particular the Civil Rights Act to this particular situation? Yeah, so that's a great question. The logic of the ruling was actually pretty straightforward. The Civil Rights Act uh, bans discrimination on the basis of sex. So, in the court's telling, if you're treating an employee differently differently because they are one particular sex, for instance, uh, that it would be fine to an employer if this person was a man married to a woman, but not if they're a woman married to a woman, then sex is what the discrimination itself turns on. That is illegal. So Jen, this was something that was kind of described as like a surprise victory for liberals. People were pretty shocked that this came down this way. So why is that? Well, so two of the court's Republican appointees, Neil Gorsuch and John Roberts, the Chief Justice, joined the court's Democratic appointees to deliver the surprising six to three victory for those arguing for anti-discrimination protections. And as you'll recall, Justice Gorsuch was a conservative who was appointed after Senate Republicans held up President Obama's chosen nominee. But he actually embraced some arguments that seemed radical to many liberals even just a few years ago, which is, even though few if any members of Congress thought they were setting up protections for gay or trans workers at that time, the 64 Act does actually protect against discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation 
and gender identity. So uh, break this down for those of us not following the, the, the legal back and forth quite as closely. Where does this go from here? I mean, it seems like this has got to be a, a huge relief for, for many people, but it also has got to introduce a, a big element of uncertainty for lots of institutions and employers and other and sort of legal frameworks that had rested upon um, where they thought the law was. So what happens now? Where does this go from here? So yeah, so what's basically the thing to take from this? Well, point one, as you note correctly, it's a massive civil rights ruling with broad implications in workplace discrimination law. So this is likely to bring up additional challenges on this basis in plenty of different fields. Um, I do want to note as well, the transgender woman who sparked this particular case, Amy Stevens, didn't actually live to see it come through. So that's kind of one sort of bittersweet to have a uh, bittersweet thing to have in the back of your mind, because there's also a big open question here. In his opinion, Gorsuch left a door open about the possibility that religious liberty claims under the First Amendment could still supersede these new workplace protections. So what they're saying is the Civil Rights Act certainly says that discrimination on the basis of sex includes gender identity and sexual orientation, but there might be a First Amendment approach that, for instance, religious groups might still take here. And we'll have to see what that looks like because Point two, there is no written constitutional prohibition on sex discrimination. That's why the conversation around the Equal Rights Amendment right now is so fraught, where it's been ratified by the appropriate number of states um, and, again, would, for, uh, would prohibit discrimination on the basis of sex in a constitutional sense. But the deadline for actually submitting that and having it uh, kind of continue to churn its way through the amendment process elapsed some years ago. So there's discussion about whether or not they're able to extend that deadline, but this ruling itself will likely be the cited landmark case for future interpretations of sex discrimination unless there is a constitutional amendment. This is the final word on it from SCOTUS. So let's move to the flip side. I mean, the Supreme Court makes news when it writes these opinions, it makes decisions, but it also kind of makes news uh, when it chooses not to take certain cases. So what were the what happened this week that the Supreme Court decided not to move on? Well, the big one, I think, for a lot of folks was Second Amendment cases. The justices turned down petitions from 10 challenges to state laws um, that were established to limit the availability and accessibility of some firearms and when they can be carried in public. And so, some of that was right here in Massachusetts, right? Some of the laws that were at stake would have affected the laws that we passed here in Massachusetts. Right. Two of them in this bunch were challenging Massachusetts rules on public carry and an assault weapons ban. And there were similar challenges coming from states like New Jersey, Maryland, Maryland, Illinois, and others. Um, a quick Supreme Court 101 here a reminder is this isn't the same as ruling against those cases. Four justices have to agree to take a case, and here only two justices disagreed with the decision to deny certiorari to the gun cases, and that was Justice Thomas and Justice Kavanaugh. So the challenged laws, uh, including in Massachusetts, are going to stay in place here. Anything we should read into that in terms of where, um, where these laws might be challenged in the future? Or is this is this kind of the end of the road for challenging these sorts of laws in the state? Well, you know, it's interesting because of course, you know, uh, gun advocacy groups will certainly try, um, but this says something interesting, I think, about the appetite of the current court to reassess these laws with the current balance on the bench right now. Um, these are guns rights fights uh, that everyone's having kind of across the country around public carry, around magazine capacity, certain handgun bans. So either the conservatives on the court are okay with the way that lower courts are interpreting this land landmark um, uh, DC v. Heller case, which basically said that you can have handguns for self-protection, or they just don't think it'll win if it comes to the court itself. So the thing about denying cert is that you don't always know why they did it. We do know that the more conservative justices on the bench, uh, specifically Justice Thomas, were really, really angry about this. And there's a pretty uh, barn burner 19 page dissent that he wrote specifically about rejecting a New Jersey case. Um, so I expect that hopefully gun groups see uh, an opportunity there, uh, I'd expect, um, where they're mostly hoping that the Supreme Court just didn't think these cases were ripe, but they might challenge similar ones going forward. It's just so interesting. I mean, I've thought like there have been just so many court situations with guns, even moving beyond the Supreme Court. Um, you know, 
gun shops going to court to try to stay open during the coronavirus crisis. This is like, we've kind of gone from not talking about guns and gun rights at all in Massachusetts to thinking about it, even if the Supreme Court decided not to take it up. Yeah, that's a great point. Any other particularly interesting ones that were denied cert in this, in this most recent round? Yeah, actually, there there were plenty of them. I mean, if anyone has a, a spare afternoon and wants to go through <laughs> hundreds of pages on the Supreme Court, thumbs up and thumbs downing all of these particular uh, cases, go for it. Um, let's some let's, of the let's ones... just say that we don't. <laughs> Give us the one or two that are the most interesting. <laughs> That's horrible, Steve. I'm so disappointed in you. So the ones that really stood out to me um, were one of them is obviously going to come up in the context of police reform. Uh, the court decided not to take on qualified immunity for police, which is that officers ne can't necessarily be li held liable personally for things they do in the course of their jobs. Um, and also they uh, denied search to a federal government challenge to California's sanctuary state law, which we've talked to in the past because there are active Massachusetts its efforts to bring up something similar. So I know it's a chaotic time. We ourselves are out of time here, um, but uh, the courts are still rolling by a video conference. So it is always uh, worth checking in. So interesting. I mean, it, I think it's just, it, it, particularly given that we're a Massachusetts podcast, I think there's just so, so many interesting implications to consider about each one of these, each one of these developments. I mean, the, the, the one I think that has gotten the most attention, of course, was the Equal Rights Amendment application. Um, but I think just given the, given the political back and forth, there's been over guns here in Massachusetts. That one also, I think, is, it, is um, a lot of people are watching and I think is something that it's sounds like from what you're saying and from what others have said in the news sense that this is not necessarily the end of this discussion here in Massachusetts. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely fair because part of it as well is all of these challenges are against pretty um, on their face, uh, kind of offensive to Second Amendment advocates policies, for instance, ones uh, limiting the types of handguns that you can actually use. Um, so I expect that, yes, as guns, gun laws uh, become stricter, and there might now be kind of encouragement because of this ruling, I expect we will see increasing lawsuits kind of as a response to that. And before we move on, I just have to say there's one thing that I miss um, from usual years when the Supreme Court rulings come down, which is when the interns- you know, The like running of the interns. <laughs> you should explain what that is, Stephanie, for those who aren't as dorky as we are and watch this on Twitter <laughs> happening in real time. Well, what it is, I think, I, I'm no expert, but you know, they get the rulings and they have them in their hands and you have to run um, across uh, the street or whatever to go get the information to your to your editor and to the other reporters at your network. And it's always fun to watch and see who's going to go the fastest and everybody wears special sneakers, but this is very gone ridiculous <laughs> conversation. Oh, so I'm gonna move on. <laughs> All right. Oh, that's horrible. I was going to say that the digital version of this is that they crashed the SCOTUS site. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, some of the rulings were so long. Hey, the interns aren't running, but neither is the website. <laughs> well, thank you, Jen, uh, for being our legal expert. And just to remind everybody who's watching live with us on Facebook, if you have any questions for our guests or for any of us, um, feel free to just leave them in the comments and we'll try to answer them. But right now we're going to shift gears and talk about a bill that was introduced this week, which aims to limit the use of force and dangerous, deadly tactics by police. The bill is called an act to save black lives, and it was filed amid nationwide unrest and demand for justice in response to the police killings of black people across the country, namely George Floyd in Minneapolis last month. And so we are joined today by one of the co-sponsors of that bill, State Representative Liz Miranda. Thank you so much for being here. It's good to see you. Good to see you too. So I'm dealing with my technical difficulties here. I think I'm okay now. <laughs> that is always part of Zoom. So, I mean, you know, just generally before we talk about anything specific, how are you, what's your reaction to all of this widespread protest and all, all of this change? You know, how are, how are you feeling and what do you see as kind of the next step here? Um, well, first, most people know me. I was a community organizer um, and a youth worker um, from the Dudley Street Triangle neighborhood in Boston. So I'm no stranger to sort of resident-led leadership or community organizing. And I actually believe um, that we need to hear more of the people's voices. And so for me, it was really incredibly moving and important to see young people leading many of these initiatives. There hasn't been anything changed in America that didn't have the voices and the feats in the hands of young people. 
And I think it's timely and justice needs to be called out each and every time that it occurs. So you filed a bill, it's called an act to save black lives. <clears throat> uh, we wanna get deep into some of the details, but before we do that, just run us through the highlights of what the bill would do. What, what's the current, uh, what are the current rules and regulations and what would this bill change? So what we found, you know, after doing some research, you know, for me, I'm not in law enforcement, I'm not an attorney and spent a lot of time over the last, really last few months thinking about what, what ways could I change criminal justice, right? And then um, we hear about Ahmaud Arbery, we heard about Breonna Taylor, then we heard about um, George Floyd, and I was like, we have to do something. My predecessor, Evandro Carvalho, had a bill that he had filed in 2017 when he was the elected for this part of Dorchester. And I looked at that bill and it was about creating a commission. And I said, I think we need to go further. And so I filed a bill with um, Senator Cindy Cream um, to really look at strengthening use of force guidelines, creating a duty to intervene. We didn't have widespread standards in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that if an officer um, noticed another officer committing a crime that there wasn't sort of an obligation to intervene. If you saw the George Floyd video, which was incredibly hard to even watch, there was an officer who stood there while three officers put their entire body weight for eight minutes and 46 seconds on a man who was already not resisting arrest. Um, one of my favorite parts of the bill is to ban chokeholds or anything that causes asphyxiation to really look at what is deadly and excessive force, uh, ban rubber bullets, ban tear gas. Um, if anyone knows anything about tear gas, it is seen as a weapon of war and combat. I don't think there's a place for it here and against protesters or on our city streets. Um, for me, my bill has a big section on oversight. Um, the governor announced the bill. There'll be lots of bills coming out, uh, I think from the House and the Senate around who is actually going to monitor when an officer uh, does severe bodily harm, creates hospitalization, or if it leads to death, who is gonna have the oversight? So you've heard people talk about independent uh, civilian boards, the governor announced the half civilian, half um, law enforcement board. I, I looked at the duty of the attorney general and said that there's a real opportunity here to have oversight come from that. Uh, and the other two things, I wanna end no knock warrants. Um, if anybody knows the case of Breonna Taylor, who was the EMT sleeping at home, officers came to the wrong house looking for the wrong person, had a no knock warrant and shot her while she was sleeping. Still, they haven't been brought to justice. If we end that um, practice in Massachusetts, it's gonna not only save lives, and I think I should take a moment here to say, you know, I'm not anti-police here. I, I think there's been a lot of rhetoric and sort of speech, hate speech on, online um, when folks saw that I filed this bill. This actually is so we can protect our police forces and protect our municipalities and the Commonwealth that if there are bad actors, they need standards, they need training, they need, you know, we need to make sure that they get decertified, but also that there are standards there that we push. Um, and there's a couple other elements of the bill, like making records of misconduct public, which I think is incredibly important. If you do something wrong, you shouldn't be able to get a job in another police department or anywhere in the Commonwealth um, that you have a badge and a gun. Yeah, Rep, uh, I mean, we're going to talk as well. I'm so glad you brought up the governor's proposal from today. We'll talk about that in a bit of detail. Um, I am curious specifically about the duty to intervene. Um, what's your hope as far as how this interacts with the kind of documented culture of silence that can be pervasive in the police force, um, uh, the, the kind of unspoken policy of officers at time turning a blind eye if there is misconduct. Um, do you think that this will compel a change there or do you think there might be resistance still? You know, we can't, you know, I mentioned earlier that our modern policing is about 160 years old you know, the founding of America and our government really started here in Massachusetts. It's centuries old. There's gonna be resistance to change, particularly since most of our public safety lacks the diversity 
um, of the places in which uh, they are meant to protect and serve. I come from the Fitz Suffolk District. It is one of the most violent areas in the state, sadly, but it's also the most incarcerated and most policed. If those two things were all happening at the same time, we would see a drop in violence. And so for me, the duty to intervene is about holding people liable. And I think that that's really the key to my duty to intervene legislation is that you have an obligation, a duty to uphold the standards of this noble career. I get it. Officers go and do a job many of us would not do. It is hard, it is dangerous. And for the most part, there are hundreds of officers and thousands in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that have integrity and do this work. If we're really serious about uh, taking out the bad actors as some of the folks wanna talk about, I think we have to make it so officers know that it's okay to intervene, but also that it's their job to intervene if someone is, um, for example, you know, I stood for eight minutes and 46 seconds about four times in the last two weeks for a moment of silence. That is an incredibly long time to watch someone have their knee on their neck with their hands in their pocket, essentially killing someone on live, uh, on live on Facebook being recorded. And so we knew immediately that that officer, officer I believe is Tran or attack, um, should have did something. He should have said, no, this man is already in handcuffs. He's not resisting arrest. And if we had had something in place here in Massachusetts or in uh, Minneapolis, uh, maybe George Floyd would be here. So let's talk about Governor Baker's bill that he introduced today. Um, and I saw that you were at the press conference talking about the bill as well. So he wants to create a police officer certification system. And he said it's critically important that this um, he called it a jumping off point, but he said it's critically important that something gets done before the legislative session ends at the end of July. Uh, so I guess a two part question. Do you think that this bill goes far enough? And do you think that the legislature is going to be able to move fast enough to get something done before the session ends? One, I believe it's a valuable first step. Um, as you noticed, most of the bill is around uh, police officer training, certification, and decertification. Um, on the list of decertification, there's of course, if you don't intervene, um, if you don't deescalate, um, if you uh, perform a chokehold or other things that I'm talking about in my use of force bill, but it doesn't go far enough because I don't think it intended to go far enough. Um, my concern with the, um, let me back up a little bit. I actually wanna commend the governor for doing something that I don't know if another governor who's Republican uh, would do. Um, and so we saw the value. And the reason why I was there today is because Representative Vieira and Representative Holmes has been working on this for years to create standards in our police force. There are 351 towns and cities in Massachusetts. That's 351 ways of doing something differently. So we desperately in Massachusetts needed a standard. But I think we can go further and do better and be stronger. And that's what I said today when I was asked because we have to say no and put it in statute that some things are just illegal here in Massachusetts. So there's no gray area. What I'm concerned about is the governor's proposal calls for a new public safety kind of oversight board that is half and half law enforcement and civilian. Um, I shared my concerns with him that I believe that um, we need to ensure that civilian oversight um, can push our law enforcement that's had a history of protecting their own um, to look at this differently. And, um, and Stephanie's uh, other question was about whether the legislature can deal with this in a prompt way. How are you feeling about that with the rest of session? I feel good. I feel good. I feel like we've gotten a commitment from the Senate president, from the Speaker of the House, that something will be done. I tell people in my community that this is both a marathon and a sprint at the same time. July 31st is a lot closer than people think to be able to get something um, discussed in the House, discussed in the Senate, put back on the governor's desk, and so that we can sign 
um, something before we go to recess. And so we know that not everything will be part of the legislation um, coming forth, but we are um, committed as a Black and Latino caucus to address structural racism, which is gonna take longer. You can't address that in a few weeks when we've been addressed, when we've been dealing with this for 400 years. Um, we also need to take into consideration the ways in which our systems, including the civil service exam and process um, is ensuring that there's continued biases against minority groups and women. And so we are, we're committed and I think something's gonna happen. All right, then State Representative Liz Miranda of the 5th Suffolk District and sponsor of the bill and Act to Save Black Lives. Thank you so much for joining us and walking us through this bill. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rep. Thank you. All right. So, oh, that was that was that was good to go through. It was uh, timely with Baker's bill as well. Um, and of course, as I mentioned earlier, even though the world is in chaos, uh, there are several things that would normally probably be front of mind that are not right now because, again, I refer you to the chaos. Um, but there is shockingly still a presidential race nearing the home stretch right now. And we talk a lot of policy here on the horse race, but we also strive to keep you up to date on all the latest election results. So here to catch us up on how things are shaping up our very own Steve Cazella. I'm refusing to give you a title, but Steve, where does Thank the you. race stand? Yeah, I was <laughs> going to say you were objecting to the Countess of Court conclusions or something. I've been the Prince of Pandemic polling or something <laughs> like that. So. If you didn't love it, you wouldn't repeat it, but here you are <laughs> saying it. I think we have to keep it. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've had it worse. Um, no, seriously, yes, the, the, the race is continuing. And I think in, in normal years at this cycle, at this point in the cycle, the political world would sort of be consumed with the presidential election and we'd be all preparing to, for conventions and, you know, feverishly speculating about vice president, vice presidential picks. And some of that's happening, but it's certainly not dominating the news <clears throat> the way that it would in a normal presidential cycle. So I think just to, to, to pick one thing that, that I would, that I'd say is marking the race right now is that Biden has an unusually large lead um, compared to recent recent history where uh, where we're talking about either national or state polling, honestly. So I just, I just grabbed a couple, a couple, um, screens to look at. This one is from 538 and shows some of the most recent polling that's been out. I chose this one because the um, the CNN poll right there, June 2nd to the 5th, is the one, of course, that's that Donald Trump's campaign threatened to sue CNN and demanded an apology and so forth, to which CNN basically told them to go pound sand because they'd done a perfectly good poll. Um, but the thing that kind of sticks out about it is that it's not, it actually isn't that unusual by the standards of other polls that have come out. So you look, for instance, at other polls that same day, and you've got national polls showing Biden from anywhere between, with a lead of anywhere between nine and 12 points. Um, and then you look up to, to the polls in the last couple of days and you see YouGov has Biden plus nine there at the top. A bunch of state polls that pretty much all show Joe Biden winning states that should either be close or that Donald Trump won in, in 2016. Um, and then June 15th, you've got a bunch of national polls also showing Biden with a lead between nine and 12 points. So I think at the moment, what I'd say characterizes this race is that it really, it is not particularly tight at the moment. That's not in any way to say that it won't get tighter, but at the moment we do see Joe Biden with a pretty considerable lead. Yeah, and I think one thing uh, that that is always kind of floating in the back of all of our heads here is when we talk about general polling, we're not really necessarily talking about Democrats here. We're mostly talking about what the president's approval is with Republicans and with independents and how strong that is. Have you seen any interesting trends over the past few weeks? Yeah, I mean, he certainly likes to talk about and tweet about his approval rating among Republicans. And um, I, I think it was Philip Bump of the Washington Post, if I'm not mistaken, tracked his tweets where he just says, 96% among the approval among the Republican Party, thank you in all caps, and took note of the fact that it's now 96. And he used to say 95 whenever he'd tweet that. And before that, he'd say 94. Uh, and so he's just been tweeting that this is, you know, kind of been <clears throat> continuing to grow the way that he sees his polling, which is not the way that the actual polling exists, but that that's the way it is. I think, though, that the, that if you're to look at it in reality, that <clears throat> um, the, the his polling really hasn't actually been 
improving. In fact, it's been tapering off somewhat. Um, his approval rating overall is has gone is nearing one of the lower points in his presidency. The 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 question really is we've seen it so many times where it's looked like we were in a decline in his approval rating and then it reverts to the mean. Um, <clears throat> at some point. So this is, for instance, 538's tracker of where Donald Trump's approval rating is using all of the national polling that they think lives up to their standards. And you can see that right now we're at 40.7 on average approve and 55.3 average disapprove. But again, you know, we've seen these kind of dips before, uh, like back in 2019, for instance, it, it was about the same and then it kind of reverted to the mean. So whether that sticks, who knows? Um, but at the moment, yes, his approval rating has been tapering off somewhat. So Steve, I wanna, I'd love to get your opinion on this. Does Donald Trump have sort of a point when he criticizes the polls kind of harkening back to 2016? My colleague at Politico, Steve Shepard, had a story today kind of looking at this, looking at how kind of those battleground state polls still haven't really totally corrected um, since 2016. So what's different now? Are things, are things different? Were, you know, just answer my question. I'm, yeah. I'm really <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that sometimes there's, there's a, a small piece of something related to a point that you could argue exists in something that Donald Trump says about polling. Um, I think that's sufficiently qualified, but Take, for instance, the CNN poll, where one of their central criticisms was that the survey had contacted all adults. But the thing is, that's a perfectly common way to do it, where you contact all adults and then you ask people questions to find out, for instance, if they're a registered voter. And then you use those numbers to do your political analysis where you're looking at only registered voters. So that kind of that there's no point to that criticism. He, nobody has a point when they pull that out. The thing that Steve Shepard was writing about, which I found particularly interesting, is the state polling in 2016. One of the issues that happened with it was that a lot of the state pollsters didn't account for education when they were creating their electorates, basically, when they were trying to figure out and describe who is going to vote. And in the past, that wouldn't really have mattered all that much because education wasn't a particularly partisan thing. It was, it was not anything close to where it is today, where if you are a white person without a college degree, you vote very much more Republican. If you're a white person with a college degree, you're much, much more likely to vote for Democrats. So you can think, for instance, that if more of those white people with college degrees answer the phone or take surveys online, and you just go with whatever data you get, you'll end up with more Democrats. And that did happen to a lot of state pollsters in 2016. There were cases, for instance, in New Hampshire where the University of New Hampshire was showing Clinton with a double digit lead, not waiting by education. Then they added an education weight to adjust basically how many college degree holders they had in their sample. And suddenly the lead was gone. Um, and you saw that happen in a lot of cases across the country. So the question is, has that been corrected? And I think what Steve Shepard was pointing out from, from his analysis and his reporting is that a lot of state pollsters haven't corrected for that even since 2016. One thing you noted, Steve, when we were looking at the 538 approval rating tracker is the kinds of ebbs and flows that happen with every consecutive news cycle right now. I recall, obviously, during impeachment, us being like, ooh, there's a dip. Um, and uh, But right now, it seems like we have kind of a triple tap of, of question marks right now. One of them, of course, is how is the president responding to police brutality issues and the protests? Another is that we have a massive pandemic happening right now. And then the third one, of course, is the economy and unemployment. So is there anything in the polling about any of those three topics that's been specifically striking to you? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, that the his approval rating on, on dealing with coronavirus certainly is not good. And that's one of the things that I think is partially explaining his uh, surprising weakness among older voters, for instance. Of course, older people are much more likely to be to die of coronavirus, much more likely to suffer serious health consequences and so forth. So I think that's, that, that's certainly part of it. Um, the thing, though, that I think just to show one more thing that we kind of have to keep in mind is how 
incredibly historically stable Donald Trump's polling has been. So um, I, I feel like I'm just doing the 538 show today here, but this is <laughs> just one more chart that they, I think is awesome that they've created, which shows how Donald Trump's approval rating compares with past presidents. And you can see that here he is compared to Barack Obama, George W. Bush, Bill Clinton, et cetera. He's the green line and they're the gray lines bouncing all around and all over the place, whereas Trump just kind of stays mm. right there. You know, so will all of this make a difference? You know, well, for other presidents, big, huge world events, like you can see George W. Bush in 9-11 here in 2001, for instance, they make huge differences. You can see for George Bush's father, for instance, you know, the, the war in Iraq for him too, as well, that there was a, a major bump in approval. But for Trump, almost whatever happens, no matter how good or bad it is, great economic numbers or getting impeached, it doesn't really make a huge difference to his approval rating. So it's, I kind of hesitate to say, even with what's going on right now, that it clearly will or clearly won't. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's kind of been the uh, segment of Steve Cazella's what to watch this week. Of course, you know, it's usually polling. It's always polling, but we're all also <laughs> watching polling. Uh, Stephanie, are you watching anything this week? I am pretty interested. So Juneteenth is on Friday on the 19th, and there is a pretty big push. Some folks have filed bills in the legislature. Some Boston city councilors are pushing to get that designated as a holiday here. So I'm going to keep my eye out to see what happens with that. What about you, Yeah, I, Well, I was going to say, I know I already did the rundown of the Supreme Court watch right now, but something that I think we're all kind of keeping an eye on is the Supreme Court is expected to make a ruling relatively soon on DACA, um, specifically about the hundreds of thousands of young immigrants who are brought to the country as children. And the reason I bring that up in part is it serves kind of an interesting contrast as far as partisanship. Um, when compared to the LGBTQ ruling, we were talking talking about earlier, where even among Republicans and Democrats, there was fairly high support for the idea that employers should not be able to discriminate against someone on the basis of sexual orientation or uh, gender preference. However, there is a huge split in terms of Democrats widely assuming um, and approving of the idea that the dreamers, these, these um, initially children uh, who are now full-time residents um, uh, saying that they should not be deported and there should remain a, a path to citizenship for them, whereas it's something around 30% of Republicans. So I'm keeping an eye on something that is interestingly even more polarizing than civil rights right now, um, that we might see something come down on relatively soon. All right. Sounds good. Well, we'll keep an eye on that and definitely come back to our chief legal correspondent when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> but for now, that is all the time we have this week. I am Steve Cazella. I'm Stephanie Murray. And I am Jennifer Smith. Our producer this week and every week is Libby Gormley. Don't forget to subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts and rate and review us online. It helps other people find us. And also make sure to sign up for the Politico Massachusetts Playbook to support Stephanie. And if you're, uh, if you're not already subscribed, which I assume you are, and <laughs> uh, call Massing Polling Group if you need any polls done, which I assume you do. So thank you all for listening. We'll see you next week.